with with this morning and and I want to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about prayer. And so one of the things about prayer is we talk about it all the time. We know what prayer is. We know, you know, we saw Jesus pray. We see different people pray in all scripture and and so we have this idea of how prayer should go. And so this morning I promise I'm not going to bore you with uh, how to pray or you know use these this acronym to pray or this is how you should do it uh, I think most of you probably have that figured out but I do want to make some observations on prayer and possibly possibly look at just a few details about prayer so but, but before we get into that I want to share some of my favorite quotes about prayer and so maybe we'll get those thrown up here and we'll look at just a couple of them maybe Close the uh, media shout. There we go. Look at that. All right. So uh, that was the welcome that I just did there. So first quote on prayer. Look at a couple of them here. And maybe you'll even recognize some of the names of some of these guys. There we go. It says, True prayer is neither a mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Spurgeon said that. I think sometimes we get, Oh, just slow down, girl. Don't be rushing me. It's my bread and butter right here and you're jumping on That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I think sometimes we boil prayer down to just that, right? It's just a mental exercise of, of talking with God or even it's a vocal performance is where we stand in front of a group of people and we lead a prayer 
over people. But it, it should be, as Spurgeon says, something much deeper than that. A spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. All right, now we'll go to the next one. Martin Luther said, To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I think there's some people that I think, man, it might be better if they were alive without breathing because then they wouldn't talk. You may be sitting there thinking, I agree, as you listen to me. Anyway, Martin Luther said that, and I think it's, it's one of those things we have to understand is essential for our spiritual health is we can't have a Christian life without prayer. I wonder if you only got to breathe as much as you prayed, how would your oxygen level be this morning? Next one says, maybe, it's okay, you're doing great. This gives awkward uh, tension, it's a speech principle. It's working good. Jim Simbola says, prayer begets revival, which begets more prayer. You know, that's the thing about prayer is the more we pray, the more we want to pray. The more we see prayer answered, the more we want to pray. There's no time in which you pray to an almighty God in which it doesn't change you, right? We pray for something and God answers it. Maybe it's not even in exactly the way that we want it answered, but we see that happen and then we, we say, man, I got to talk to the God who created everything, uh, which then makes us want to do it a little more. Jim Simbola said that. We'll, we'll see we'll, a few more thoughts that Jim Simbola had as we move through today. Uh, let's see if we can find the next one. This is Billy Graham. All right, so this is good as scripture for most of us, right? He says, true prayer is a way of life, not just for use in cases of emergency. I didn't put this one up there, but I think it ties in with it. Corey Ten Boom, which she was a missionary. If you're familiar with her, she said, is prayer your engine or your spare tire? That one's pretty good, too. That probably should have made the screen. Do we just turn to prayer when something goes bad? Or, or, or is our life marked by prayer? Let's see what the next one says. This one's from the Christian Post. It says, the Christian Post says the number one sign of a dying church is prayer has become an afterthought. Surely that's not us. Let's look at the next slide. E.B. Bounds said, When faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. How much time do we spend in prayer, church? How much time do you spend as an individual in prayer? Can we recognize that there's a difference between the two? The amount of time that we spend as individuals in prayer is very important for our individual walk. But the time that we spend corporately in prayer is very important for us as a church. Because when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. The next one was by the great revival preacher R.A. Torrey. He said, we must spend much time on our knees before God if we are to continue in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever think in your life you get to the point where you're just trying to move on with your own power? As a Christian, that should never be our life story, right? We should never get to a point where we just get to the next day because of our own power. When you accepted Christ, when you accepted the work done on the cross, your power stopped. And the power of Christ on the cross took over. You with me? And so how is it that we think we can get from day to day, from month to month and year to year on our own power? If we are to continue in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to spend time in prayer. The next slide. We're almost done with the slides. This comes from Jim Simbola's book. He, is, he references an Australian preacher that he met once and never met again. But he walked up to him in, in a church service. And because Simbola was under so much conviction about, about their attendance numbers. And the guy said, you can tell how popular a church is by who comes on Sunday morning. 
You can tell how popular the pastor is by who comes on Sunday night. Most importantly, you can tell how popular Jesus is by, come, by who comes to the prayer meeting. How does that make you feel, church? Makes me feel rather uneasy to stand in front of you today. Sometimes I think we've moved past the power of the Holy Spirit and we're trying to move forward in our own power. And I think that's a very scary place to be as a church. Christian Post said that the first earmark of a dying church is a church that's made prayer an afterthought. How many of us will be back for prayer? Prayer, in its very essence, is the ability to speak to the creator of all things. We, we don't believe in a religion where we have to pray to a saint and that saint then can talk to God for us or, or anything like that. We believe that because of the work of Christ, we have the opportunity to speak and for the God of the universe to hear us. Why don't we do that all the time? Why is it that we, like Corey Ten Boom says, we, we, just, we just need that spare tire when something bad happens? Billy Graham said we turn to prayer in an emergency. But we have the opportunity to speak and for the God of all creation to hear us. And we don't do that constantly. How is it we think that we can flourish as a church or as an individual if we don't talk to God? more than we do anything else. Let's see if there's any more. That's the last one. Prayer. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We were in Sunday school last week and if you're in the Gospel Project, you, you're talking about the churches in the book of Revelation. And we specifically looked at Ephesians, uh, not Ephesians, at the church at Ephesus and, and how Christ had challenged them to return to their first love. Church, when, when I've talked to many of you as individuals, I love hearing the history of our church because I, I wasn't there, right? I don't know when the big moments were. I don't know when those monumental times in our church's history happened. But oftentimes I hear things like, you know, used to we were the church that everybody turned to when they needed prayer. Even if they went to church somewhere else, they made sure that Three Creeks knew because we put so much emphasis on prayer. Are we used to, to do all these things and see God bless it in such a way? Are we used to do this? Are we used to do that? But church, I think all of those used tos are underlined by the fact that we used to focus on prayer more than anything else. Now, I obviously wasn't here, and I know there, there are circumstances that I don't know because I wasn't here, but I've read several, uh, several books by a former pastor here, Lil Snow. And he... He talks a lot about prayer. And so I can just imagine that it would have been one of the emphasis of his ministry here because of the passion that he has for it. And I, I've, I've read his most recent book. Um, it's called The Forgotten Altar. And so he takes the, the Old Testament picture of the, the tent and the, the, the tabernacle as it was, and he talks about how we often focus on you know, the, the altar of incense or the off, altar where the, the offering takes place. But he says we often forget that there was another place in the tent, and that place was specifically for prayer. And church, we, we as not just three creeks, but we as a church in, in our nation and even around the world, we, we focus so much on worship music. Uh, we focus so much on good preaching. But I think Lil Snow hit the nail on the head when he said we've forgotten that there's an altar dedicated to prayer. It's, it's the first stop when you enter the tent, right? Before you get to worship, before you get to sacrifice, before you get to any of that, 
prayer is where we should be first. But somehow we just skip right over that. And the importance of that stop before we can get to anything else. Because if you can't, if you can't get past the first stop, how can you even approach the next altar? How can you even approach the altar where we worship if we don't first approach the altar of prayer? So church, I want to look at Acts chapter 2. And I want to see a picture of the early church and draw a few truths from there that I think maybe we can apply to ourselves today. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, it's my hope and my desire that this morning, this morning, Father, that you would convict us that prayer is, can't, it, that it can't be an afterthought. Father, that prayer is, is one of the most vital things that we can do as individuals to increase our walk with you. Father, that prayer is one of the most vital things. Father, I would even venture to say that without prayer, our church can do nothing apart from that. God, that, that you would convict us through the picture of your early church that, that we have a call to do something for you, but that call can't happen until we pray. God, thank you for the example that we'll see in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just continue to stir in each of our hearts this morning. God, take distractions out of our minds. Take the weights that are on our shoulders. Lift them away. And God, let us give this time wholly to you. Lord, we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I love this passage of Scripture. I've even preached this passage of Scripture before, but I want to take another look at it and, and refocus on just a few thoughts here. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think the picture of the early church is something that the modern church, the church of today, should strive to be more like. And I know, I know some of you are sitting there thinking, well, when you read that, that sounds pretty, uh, pretty socialist. Uh, because I, I, I can understand that. As, as you read that, the first impression is, well, you know, there are people that worked hard and had lots of things, and they sold it to give it to other people so that they could all have everything. I, I get that that, in our, in our modern context, wants us to lend our minds to socialism or something like that, but it's far from it when you really begin to understand the historical context of what's happening. So to do us all a favor, today we're not even going to focus on that part of it, okay? I want us to look specifically at verses 42, 43, and 46 and 47. So we're going to take that little piece out about selling things and all in common. We're just going to set that to the side today. That'll be for another time, okay? So what I want us to focus on are the verses where we see a very specific impact that prayer has on the early church. You follow with me? But, but trust me, there are more places in the book of Acts that account the early church's dependence on prayer. It's not just one passage. In fact, if we were to begin at the book of Acts and just walk through a few chapters, some of the things that we would see uh, in Acts chapter 1, even the first verse of Acts chapter 2, we see that there's 120 people gathered in the upper room and they're praying because that's what Jesus told them to do, to go and to wait and to pray until the Holy Spirit came. And so they gather together and it says that they're of one accord and the Holy Spirit shows up. Church, I wonder what would happen if we were of one accord today. Do you think the Holy Spirit might show up in a new way? That's very, I think it's a very plausible possibility. A little bit further in Acts chapter 1, in verse 24, you see where it specifically says that the disciples prayed for wisdom to call Matthias as, uh, the, to fill the 12th slot, so to speak. 
you keep going in Acts chapter 4, verses 24 and 31. This is when John and Peter had been called before the Sanhedrin and they were told not to preach in the name of Christ anymore. And so John and Peter go back to the, the believers and say, well, the Sanhedrin said that if we keep preaching, they're just gonna, it's going to get worse for us. And so what did the church do? They didn't back down. They didn't say, oh, well, maybe we should go and reach out into a new area and start a new work there. Or, they said, no, 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 let's pray about it. And when they prayed for boldness, the place that they were in shook. I don't, I don't see any ceiling tiles missing. Um, I'm not sure that, that this place has been shook recently. We keep going. Acts chapter 6, um, the apostles called everyone together and they said, listen, we need some help in, in ministering to people. And so they said, let's call for a deacon. And they, they prayed. And as a church, they come together in one accord and selected seven men to serve. What was the result of that? The first martyr. That's what happened. Right? You see, we think when we pray just something awesome and, and amazing happens, and that's true, it does, but oftentimes it's not exactly what we prayed for. I wonder, and I'm not picking on our deacons, so don't take this the wrong way, but I wonder if when you were called to be a deacon of this church, if you knew that just within a matter of weeks your, your life is what you would have to give, would you still have accepted the call? I wonder if the same could be said of me when, when my ordination was about to happen. They said, hey, we're going to ordain you, but in two weeks we're going to kill you. I don't know. But I wonder, could Stephen have been so forgiving, even in the moment of his death, had it not been for the collective prayers of the church? Keep going, Acts chapter 12 uh, Peter is in prison, and the church prays, and what happens? Peter just strolls right on out, right? They're at, they're, at the, they're at the place that they're gathered together, and they're praying, and they're praying, God, let Peter be freed. And they hear, who is it? Oh, it's Peter. It ain't Peter. We're busy praying for Peter. He's like, no, it really is. You guys are praying, and I got freed, Right? The people praying stuff happens. Acts chapter 13, the church is praying. What happens in Acts chapter 13? We see God call the first missionaries. Paul gets called to go on his first missionary journey. Right? Amazing things happen for the glory of God when the church stops and prays. Acts chapter 16, Paul is praying because, uh, guess what? He's in prison now too. Uh, and so he's praying. What happens? Another earthquake happens. And the door of his jail cell just swings wide open. So Paul just, no, Paul doesn't even walk out. I think maybe Peter had the edge on him in education here, right? If you're in jail and you think maybe they're going to kill you and God swings the door open, I'm not fast, but I'm going to be giving it all I've got. You with me? But not Paul. He just hunkers on down and just keeps hanging out, praying and singing. And so the jailer wakes up because he kind of dozed off and he turns to Paul and you know, turns to the door and sees it open. And he thinks, well, he's gone. And so he draws his sword to kill himself because he knew it would be better than the punishment he would have to take for letting Paul escape. And what does Paul do? He says, stop. We're still right here. And so when Paul prayed, not only did God open the door and say, Paul, you're welcome to go, but Paul, uh, yeah, Paul didn't leave. Paul sits there, he keeps worshiping, and the jailer gets saved. So just in a, in a handful of verses that we've just discussed here, what have we seen? The church prays for boldness, and God gives it to them. The church waits in prayer for the Holy Spirit, and God gives it to them. They pray for freedom for people from bondage. God gives it to them. They pray, Paul's praying, and a man gets saved. What else do we need as Christians? We need boldness. We need uh, salvations to happen. We need freedom from whatever binds us up. You see, prayer is the answer for everything that we need as a believer. But sometimes I think it's the most underused tool that a Christian has. So last week uh, in Sunday school... Sometimes we're talking and things come out of my mouth and I don't even know where they come from. And so if you guys remember, last week the phrase that came out of my mouth is, we won't put down the McRib to go eat the ribeye. Right? 
That's good if you slow down and think about it, right? That's the world we live in, okay? We have the opportunity to pray and to sit in communion with the God of our creation, but we've made ourselves busy, and we won't put down a McRib. You guys ever eaten a McRib? Are you aware of what they make those out of? I mean, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and say I've never eaten one. But like Paul said, I was once ignorant, and now I know, right? Come on. you you got to put those things behind you. You've got to step away from the McRib, and you've got to sit at the table where God's offering you a ribeye. We've got to realize that prayer is the foundation for us. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I want to point out a few things in these couple of passages. He said, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And so when we first glance at that, we think, All right, apostles' teaching, yeah, we, we're sitting here right now listening to you blabber. We got that one down. That's not exactly what it means. Yeah, I'm sure they were listening to the apostles preach. But the apostles teaching might would even better translate their elaboration on scripture. Okay, so this was the idea that they were sitting down together studying God's word. Not just coming once a week and hearing a preacher preach and then going home. If that's the, the fulfillment of your spiritual needs, uh, if, if that's all the spiritual food you're getting is this morning you're probably going to need to drink your nutritional shake when you get home um, because it's not going to get you through the week. You follow what I'm saying? And so one of the, the earmarks of the early church, they had devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Not only were they listening to them, but they were taking it. They were taking the scripture that they were using. They were going home and they were studying it on their own. They were growing with Christ because they were studying God's Word. I would say that you can have as much prayer as you want in your life. You can be the foremost authority on prayer. You can spend time on your knees at your bedside every day so much that your carpet has wore out. You know what I'm talking about? You ever, you ever see an old man at his house who's had his recliner in the same spot for probably 60 years? You know, the carpet's just wore out right there. That can be your bedside where you kneel to pray. But if you don't spend time studying Scripture your prayer will be in vain. I believe that God speaks, and you guys might think I'm crazy, but I think sometimes in our world He speaks to a lot of different mediums. I think He can speak through music. I think He can speak through television. Uh, obviously, we had a great testimony this morning of how God spoke through a movie. Right? God can speak through anything, but where does God speak through most? His Word. Don't be fooled to think it's something else. God speaks most through His Word. And so if you're not devoting yourself as an individual to studying scriptures, then you're missing out on part of the, the biggest part of prayer. You talk with your voice or with your mind or however it looks when you pray. You know, I love this idea. Quick sidetrack. I love this idea that when we pray, we have to close our eyes. Where do you think that came from? Who do you think the first people said, listen, when we pray, you've got to close your eyes? I don't, I don't know when it started. That's just kind of a rhetorical question. But the thought is, sometimes I like to pray when I'm driving my car. Do you see the potential problem there? I'm, I'm a pretty good driver. Don't, don't uh-uh. Y'all know. Great driver. We don't, y'all are still laughing about it. Sheesh. Some things y'all can know, but not everybody else needs to know. You following me? Let's leave the driving. I think we get hung up that think, we think prayer has to be certain things, right? You don't have to have your eyes closed to pray. Sure, is it respectful? Sure. In a, in a church context, is that maybe the best thing to do? Sure, because that's kind of what's expected, and that's just fine. But I wonder if we said, you know what? My prayer time with God might not look like me sitting beside my bed with my eyes closed. Maybe it's me walking. Maybe, maybe you're a walker and your favorite time to pray is when you walk. Again, I'm not coordinated enough to walk with my eyes closed. Maybe it's when you're in the shower. Maybe you can shower with your eyes closed, but I kind of like to make sure I'm getting all the dirt. 
It, whatever works for you, right? We don't have to be caught up in this mold that, that this is exactly what prayer looks like. It can look like a lot of things, but it has to have the study of Scripture to go with it. So we got that. The next, the next thing you see in that passage is, and the fellowship. And you think, man, we have got the fellowship down. We're Southern Baptists. Well, we'll whip out a crock pot on somebody quicker than they know what can happen. We do got the eating part down. I've struggled in six and a half years to just maintain this. Um, and I don't say that in a... <laughs> it's not... <laughs> we eat good around here. I, I, I'm with you there. A couple of weeks ago, me and Brock beseeched you for banana pudding and... And the Lord blessed, and it was good, right? What was it you wanted? Pie. pie. We had some pies. I loved it. I knew it was a good night when the ladies come to me and said, I think we need to get one more table out because the desserts are really filling everything up. I said, God is good, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, we think we got that down, but guys, let's be, let's be honest for just a second. This word fellowship, not the eating time, okay? We're going to see that in a moment, but this is different from it, okay? This fellowship, this is literally the sharing of the work of ministry, right? They said, first, make sure, and these are in no particular order. They're all equal parts here. He says, first, be sure and study your scriptures. Second, fellowship together. Work together, right? Church, you can't expect your pastor to do all the ministry. You can't. I know some people do, but you can't. If you set that unrealistic expectation, he will burn out and he will be gone. You cannot place that burden 100% on his shoulders. The work of the ministry, sure, he's called to lead. He's called to give vision and to guide. But the work of the ministry is for every single believer. If you're a Christian in this room today, the ministry of this church is just as much a part of who you are as it is the man that fills this pulpit on a weekly basis. You hear me? Fellowship. Share in the ministry. Work together. The next one, here we go, is to the breaking of bread. I knew it had to be in there, right? The early church was clearly Southern Baptist. No. Sorry. The breaking of bread here is specifically referring to communion, right? You remember that thing that we do a couple, three, four, five times a year where we have the little crackers and the juice and we pass it around and we make it real ornate. I love it. It is a picture of Christ's sacrifice for the church. But when they say sharing in the breaking of bread, they're not talking about eating together. They're talking about doing the Lord's Supper. They're talking about taking communion together. Because when we gather together, we're called as a church to remember the sacrifice of Christ. We have to realize that if we come together and we do all these wonderful things, but we do it without remembering the sacrifice that Christ made, we're just wasting our time. We're just having a, great, a grand old time. We might as well be paying our dues to the social club, right? If we do anything without the focus being on the broken body and spilled blood of Jesus Christ, we're spinning our wheels. Church, don't let that be us. Let us focus on studying Scripture. Let us share the work of the ministry. Let us remember Christ in all that we do. And then finally, this is, this is the bread and butter of this passage for me. And the prayers. Church, I think, I think this prayer indicates it's kind of a twofold word, right? You have to pray on your own. You have to spend time in prayer. I have to spend time in prayer. If, if we don't, we can find no direction as an individual. If, if we're not praying, we might as well not be breathing, right? We have to spend time praying. The, the other side of that is, as a church, we have to spend time praying together. And so you've got individual prayer, you've got corporate prayer, but what's the difference between individual prayer and corporate prayer? This is something I'm really wrestling with, and so this is not a definitive answer. If I ever nail this down, I'll probably write a book too, right? Yeah, I don't want that to happen. My language isn't real good. Individual prayer. That's when I talk to God, however that works for me. 
So would corporate prayer then be when I talk to God on behalf of all of us? Is that like when I prayed a few minutes ago before we started? Is that corporate prayer? Or is that me praying for all of us? I might think that that's still an individual prayer. But my prayer was aimed, hopefully, that God would move in all of us, that he would clear distractions from all of us. But I think it's still an individual prayer, right? So I wonder then if corporate prayer might sound a little bit like heaven. Now, Bubba, you've already said three or four times that we're Southern Baptist Church. And so if all of us get to praying at one time, that might sound different. I think it might. Do we think that our God is too small to hear all of our prayers at one time? Do we think that he's too small to be able to, uh, you know, write down our needs as quick as all of us can give them? I don't think he is. I hope that you don't think he is either. I heard a, a story just the other day that, that there was a small town out in Texas who the church was on this side of the street, and as much as they wanted to vote against it, there was a nightclub moving in right across the street. And so the nightclub comes in, sets up shop, business is booming, right? All the Methodists, they'll talk to each other when they get over there, but the Baptists, they just look the other way. That's not the joke. That's just the truth. Um, so the church is offended that the nightclub is right across the street. And so the church says, you know what? Every Friday night when that church, when that nightclub opens up, we're meeting at the church and we're praying that God would remove that nightclub. And so this went on for probably two or three months. And, and, and surprisingly enough, attendance was faithful at those prayer meetings. And so the church gathered and they said, God, we don't need this type of impact in our community. We don't need this negative influence. Please remove that nightclub. And so one of the Friday nights they're gathered and they're praying and a thunderstorm rolls in. Straight line winds come through. And the church on one side of the street, nightclub on the other, whoo, lays the nightclub down. The nightclub owner finds out that the church had been praying for such an event to happen. And so he does what every nightclub owner would do in such a time. He sues the church. Takes them to court. Said, they are the cause of my nightclub being destroyed. So the, the representatives of the church, I don't know if it's the pastors or, or deacon or, or whoever the representative was, they show up in court and, and the judge says, well, what do you have to say for yourself? And they say, listen, it, it wasn't us. We had nothing to do with it. And so the judge looks at him and says, you mean to tell me that the nightclub owner has more faith in your prayer than you do? Let me say it again. I know you guys didn't catch it. The judge looks at the church and says, the nightclub owner has more faith in your prayers than you do. Church, I wonder if we've lost faith in our prayers. If we've lost uh, the, the picture that when we speak in prayer, God hears us. Whether it's one of us praying as an individual one of us praying for all of us, or all of us praying for all of us. God hears us, and God hears the prayers of a righteous man, right? Seems like Scripture might even say that somewhere. So church, I wonder if, if we focus on these four things, Scripture, sharing the work of the ministry, communion, remembering the sacrifice of Christ, and praying individually and corporately, what might look different for us. I think Scripture shows us what that would look like. Verse 43, it says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You know, the word awe in its very origin was created to speak only of God. We use the word awesome for everything nowadays. Did you just see that movie? It was awesome. This pizza, awesome. My dog, awesome. Right? We use it for everything. But in its very origin, the word only describes God and His work. 
And so when it says, awe came over every soul, they were seeing God work in amazing ways. They were so taken aback by what the Lord was doing that they didn't know how to process it. Verse 46, slide down with me past that part in the middle. And it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Finally, there it is, church. This breaking the bread, different than the other breaking the bread, right? This is eating together. They were living life together. They were, they were standing in awe of what God was doing. Then they were gathering together and living life out with each other. How many of us uh, as members of this church, I'm talking about this individual body, how many of us live life together every day? When something happens, do you call somebody else in the church? Maybe you do. I think a few of you are definitely living that way. Well, let's be honest, a few of you are kin to a few of the others, right? But how often do we call somebody who we're not kin to, that's just a brother or sister in Christ, and say, hey, I had a horrible day. Can you be praying for me? Are we living life that way? And then on the other end of the line, say, hey, uh, you know what? Dinner's almost ready. You just come over here, and we'll pray together, and we'll eat together. Right? That's, that's what verse 46 is. In their homes, early church, they lived together. They lived life together, not just on Sundays or Wednesdays. Right? Verse 47. Uh, or don't, don't skip over the glad and generous parts. Uh, I know I'm getting long-winded, so I'll wrap it up. Glad and generous. Have you ever tried to pray for somebody when you're mad at them? I mean, I mean genuinely. Have you ever tried to pray somebody for somebody when you're mad at them? I honestly don't think it can happen. Right? You, you, you maybe can utter some words. You maybe can go through the motions, but I don't think you can genuinely, from your heart, pray for somebody that you're mad at. And so I think that when it says that they were glad and generous, they had glad and generous hearts. You see, when you live life together, stuff is going to happen, right? You're going to get aggravated with the people that are around you. That's just how we are as people. But at some point, we have to get over that, and we say the bigger picture is, uh, is definitely more important than what we got going on right here right now, right? Glad and generous hearts, they prayed for one another. Verse 47, praising God, having favor with all people. I think when we live our lives in such a way that prayer is at the foremost of who we are, that the world is going to see that. Remember the used to's that I mentioned earlier? People used to come to our church even if they didn't go here to ask for prayer. That's what the world needs again. That's what we need, again, for the glory of God, is we need people to understand that we are praying people, that we're not gossiping people, we're not backbiting people, we're praying people. That's what our community needs. That's what we need, church. That's what the world needs, is churches to have glad and generous hearts and love people. Because when that happens, God's going to give us favor with people, and the Lord will add to our numbers every day. You know, the statistic is uh, that 80%, kind of roughly 80% of churches in North America are plateaued or declining. Specifically in the Southern Baptist Church, 74% of churches are plateaued or declining. I looked this morning at this date in 2005, August 21st, so it's roughly the same. August 21st, 2005, there were 234 people in attendance that morning. You look around, you can count. Um, that's not where we're at today. What's changed? Used to, we prioritized prayer. Used to. Right? Easter that same year, there were 327 people in this building. Can you imagine 327 people in here? I can't. I wasn't here. Probably a lot of you were. I can't. Church, it's time for a spiritual checkup. It's time for us to ask the hard questions. How do we get back to the point where we used to be? Where we prayed, we were known as a praying church, and because of our prayers, it gave us a glad and generous heart. God blessed that with the people that were around us, and he added to our numbers every day. One last statistic for you, and then I'll hush, I promise. A healthy church, for every 20 people in that church, there'll be one new convert to Christ every year. Not just somebody gets saved and never seen, but one person who gets saved and plugged into the church. So church, if there's 140 of us in this room today, by next year there ought to be 147 of us. Seven new people come to Christ. Not move from another church, 
not, not moved into town. I'm talking about new Christians, people who had not been saved by the grace of God, who are now saved by the grace of God, who are growing in Christ in this church because of the 140 of us in this room. Seven more next year. And so then the next year it ought to look like that again. And the next year it ought to look like that again. So church, I ask you the question. 15 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever date I just told you, there were 234. There's 140 today. I'm just guesstimating. You can count them as they go out of the door. What's changed? Church, I think it's prayer. I think prayer has changed. And church, if we don't do something about it, if we don't start taking prayer seriously again, where are we going to be in another 10 years? The answer to that question scares me. And that will scare you too. If we're going to do life together, like the early church, we have to study scripture. We have to uh, fellowship. We have to share the load of the ministry. We have to take communion. We have to, to remember the breaking of Christ's body and the shedding of his blood in everything that we do. And we have to pray together. So church, I want to end with this. The, the invitation will happen as they always do. But I want you to think about this. What if during this invitation time, whether that's with our eyes open, our eyes closed, heads bowed, looking up to heaven, I don't think it matters. I think whatever matters to you matters to you. But what if every one of us in our hearts all prayed to God right now? Do you think he could hear the prayers of all of us? I think that he can, and he does. And my prayer is that today he will. And that our prayers would be very much aligned of God, give us a passion to be what we used to be. Give us a passion to be a church, to be a body of believers who are known for prayer. Because when we see prayer happen, we're going to see revival happen. When revival happens, guess what? We're going to want to pray more. I didn't put it up, but one of, the, one of the quotes said, Billy Graham says that you want to see more evangelism happen in your church? Pray more. Study God's word more. If we want to see people saved, we have to pray more. So church, if you would stand with me. And I'm going to pray, but church, I don't want it to be me praying over you guys. I want you to pray at the same time I'm praying. I want you to ask God to give you a heart, a desire to pray more. Maybe you feel moved to come down to the altar and pray there. That would be amazing. But I don't think it matters. If you want to pray right where you're at, pray right where you're at. I think what matters is that we say, God, here I am. Prayer is important to you, God, and I want it to be important to me. If you're here today and, and none of this makes any sense to you because you don't have a clue what we're talking about, maybe you need to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd love to talk with you about that right there. I'd love to show you how to pray in a way that God can hear you. Father, we come to you right now. God, it's my prayer. Lord, I hope it's the prayer of all that are gathered today. That right now, that we trust that you're hearing the voices of all of us. Not mine because I'm on a microphone or not somebody else because they think there's somebody. But Father, you hear all of us because we belong to you. God, give us a passion to study your word, a passion to share the work of the ministry together, a passion, Father, to remember your son in all that we do. But most importantly, Father, let us build that on a foundation of prayer. Lord, without, without doing the things that you call us to do with prayer, Lord, we're just doing them in vain. We're just doing them for our own sake. God, let that not be the heartbeat of this church. Let us be, Father, what we know that we can be because of you. But, Lord, let it all rest on prayer. Lord, if there's someone here that needs you today, God, I just pray that you would move in their hearts. Maybe there's a believer here that, that says, I don't talk to God as much as I need to. Let them be stirred by your Holy Spirit today. Father, and let this place shake. Lord, we love you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.